Basic Fire Behavior and Suppression, a six-part course presented by the Province of British Columbia, Ministry of Forests, Protection Branch. Hello again, good afternoon, and welcome to the second of our three broadcasts today on basic fire behavior and suppression, or how they work and how they're stopped. In this broadcast, we'll present two more modules, number three and four, lessons three and four, if you will. Uh, first of all, we'll do working safely with tools and equipment. Uh, after that, we'll again open the switchboard for you people around the province to give us a call and ask our experts uh, any questions on your mind. Um, after we do that, it's uh, module or lesson four on fire behavior, and then again, we'll take more calls with more questions you may have. Uh, with me again, of course, are Jeff Bate and Fred Marshall, Jeff being the manager of fire, the fire management section of the protection branch of the Ministry of Forests, and Fred's a forestry instructor with Malaspina College in uh, Nanaimo. Uh, a couple of quick things before we get started. Number one is, any facilitators who have not yet called us to let us know how many you have with you, please do so between 2 and 3 o'clock. After we go off the air with this segment and before the next one at 3, give us a shout, please. Also, the, the course is designed to train people who have a, no experience in fire suppression to fight fires in a safe and efficient manage, manner. Register students write a test and a certificate will be issued to those who pass the test today. If you haven't registered for the course, and if you wish to do so, you can contact the nearest Ministry of Forest office, speak with the protection officer, and make arrangements with them. Many of the district officers will wish to train additional workers, so don't uh, hesitate to give them a call if you want the training. So, having said all of that, let's move on to Lesson or Module 3, Working Safely with Tools and Equipment. You are watching Module 3, working safely with tools and equipment. The rules for the safe use of hand tools have emerged from years of experience in their use by forest firefighters. These rules are basic, but must be made habit. Occasionally do hand tools cause serious injury or death, but they frequently cause painful cuts, bruises, minor disfigurements and disabilities. A missing finger, a blind eye, a limp, a nasty scar, etc can be the result of misuse of common hand tools discussed in this module. To avoid injury, follow these basic rules. Keep sharp edges covered or shielded when they are not in use. This will prevent accidental impact and will protect the edge of the tool. Avoid leaving tools where they can be walked on or tripped over. Lean them or implant them. Tools in transit are to be tied or placed securely on a rack or in a toolbox to prevent the risk of people falling into the tools or the tools striking people. Carry tools at waist level and not over the shoulder. This will allow you to throw the tools clear if you fall and will prevent injury to the head region of others. When passing tools to others, pass tools handle first and do not throw tools. Learn to select the best tool for the job to be done. You will be guided by your straw boss. The tools normally used for firefighting in BC are, for fire line location, the single bitted axe. Single bitted means that it has one edge. Some axes have two edges. The axe is used for blazing and chopping. It is sometimes faster and easier to use a can of spray paint or a red ribbon tied around trees. To use the axe, start by taking a practice swing to ensure that it is safe to swing the axe. Remove any obstruction before starting to chop. Place one foot in front of the other, and with the legs apart, maintain firm footing and balance while chopping. As with all tools, maintain a firm grip at all times. For clearing, that is, removing the fuel from the fire line, a chainsaw is used to remove large trees. A double-bitted axe is used on small trees, up to about 8 inches in diameter, and Sandvik, the Sandvik tool, is used for smaller fuels. To use the Sandvik, maintain a firm grip and make sure you have the clearance to swing the tool. You will not be asked to use a chainsaw or to fell large trees. For grubbing and trimming, that is, clearing out root systems to get down to mineral soil and break the fuel continuity, the Pulaski tool and the long-handled junior or lady-type shovel is used. The shovel is essential on any fire. It is the most widely used tool on the fire line. It is a fairly safe tool to use if you are not working too closely to other people. 
Maintain at least 10 feet of distance between you and the nearest worker. Maintain sure footing at all times. The shovel is used for cleaning and trimming the trench, scraping in light going, digging, trimming dead limbs and moss from standing trees, and throwing dirt to smother fires. The Pulaski tool is a combination of a mattock and an axe. It is useful in almost all types, but it is neither the best chopping tool nor the best grubbing tool. It is best used where a quick change from chopping to grubbing is required. When this quick change is not required, the best tools for grubbing and trimming are the mattock and the axe. To use the Pulaski, make sure you have the clearance to swing the tool. Maintain at least 10 feet of distance from the nearest worker. Keep the feet apart with one leg ahead of the other. Hold the tool firmly and let the weight of the tool do most of the work. In light fuel situations, the steel broom is a useful tool. It is used for sweeping moss from trees, rocks and bluffs, and sweeping the fire line clear. For mop-up and patrol, the hand tank pump is indispensable. Although their capacity and rate of delivery is limited, properly used, they do effective work with very little water. They are used to extinguish spot fires, cool down hot spots, extinguishing fire in snags, and containing burning off fires. The burning off strategy is explained in Module 5. Portability is the main advantage of the hand tank pump, for often a little water in the right place at the right time will save the situation. The hand tank pump, when full of water, will weigh about 50 pounds. Since you will likely have other things to carry, a shovel and or a Pulaski, it is especially necessary for you to be careful of your footing. Learn to use firm and balanced footing. As mentioned earlier in Module 2, loss of footing is the prime cause of accidents on the fire line. The proper way to use tools will be demonstrated to you and practiced by you after you have completed this module. On large fires, you will not be required to sharpen your own tools. This will be done for you. However, you must learn to distinguish a sharp tool from a blunt tool. Here we show this difference with axes. Shovels must also be kept sharp. In case you should need to sharpen tools, it is essential when sharpening tools that A, the tool be held firmly in some holding device, B, a hand guard is used where necessary, C, eye protection is used where there is danger to the eyes. Use only sharp tools. Blunt tools are much more dangerous than sharp tools as they will deflect rather than cut and thus are more difficult to control. The handles of tools require your examination also. Choose only those handles which are straight, free of splinters, and unpainted. It is important that you wear industrial type gloves on the fire line as paint and or splinters on tool handles will give you blisters if you are not wearing gloves. You will not likely be assigned to work with heavy equipment tractors, skidders, or pumpers. However, some knowledge of safe practice is required. Many beginning firefighters are new to both forests and to heavy equipment used on the fire line. The emergency fire line environment can be confusing in the initial stages. Authorization is required before working on heavy equipment. If you are required to approach a working tractor, you must first attract the operator's attention from a safe distance. Two tree lengths is considered to be a minimum safe distance, since a tractor could push over a tree, which in turn could push over another tree. Should you be assigned to work as a crew person, wear a brightly colored hat or clothing or personal protective clothing if issued. Do not mount a machine until it has stopped moving. The operator alone is to ride tractors and skidders. Crew people are to stay off the machines at all times when the machines are working. When working with tractors and skidders at night, crew people are to wear two headlamps, one shining in front, the other shining in back so that the operator of the machine can see them. As a crew person, you are jointly responsible with the operator to be briefed in the safe operation of the equipment before the work begins. If asked to work with cables and winches, get specific safety instructions on working with these. There are dangers which will not be discussed in this course. Generally, work no closer than two tree lengths from a working tractor, and do not work directly downhill from a working tractor or skidder. Helicopters. You may be transported by a helicopter to a fire. When the engine is running, the helicopter is a hazardous machine. The main rotor and the tail rotor are the hazards. 
Approach and leave a helicopter only when you are signaled to do so. Approach and leave in a crouching manner and be 50 feet before resuming a standing position. Do not stay under a helicopter as it takes off in case it has to land again. Approach and leave within the pilot's field of vision and on the downslope side. If you leave on the upslope side, the main rotor will be a danger. Do not walk towards the rear of a helicopter as the tail rotor is not always visible as it rotates at high speed. The rotation of the main rotor creates a strong suction and anything which is sucked into the rotor will damage the rotor. A sleeping bag, for instance, if thrown to or from the cockpit, will snag and damage the rotor. The result of such a mistake would cost forty to sixty thousand dollars in cash and would prevent the craft from serving the needs of the fire line. It could also threaten lives of firefighters if they had intended to try to escape a potentially dangerous fire situation. The rule then is not to allow any loose materials around a helicopter such as tarpaulins, blankets or cardboard. Hold on to your hard hat or use a chin strap to avoid it being sucked up. Protect your eyes from swirling dust when you are near a working helicopter. Carry tools or other gear at waist level and not over your shoulder in case they foul up the rotor and injure you. When traveling, board with the gear when the pilot gives you the signal. Do not touch the plexiglass bubble as dirt on the bubble will impair the pilot's vision. Fasten your seatbelt and keep it fastened. If assigned to helicopter loading duties, use ear and eye protection and a hard hat with a chin strap as issued. Stay clear until the helicopter has landed. Move out as soon as you have completed the loading operation. Thus, landing, loading, and takeoff can take place safely with minimum delay. Smoking is not allowed within 50 feet of an aircraft or its fuel. You will not be involved with air tankers except that you may be on the ground when a retardant drop takes place. Prior to a retardant drop, a bird dog aircraft will sound a warning which will sound like this. This is your warning to get out of the direct line of the drop aircraft or to take cover or lie prone. How to protect yourself if caught in a retardant drop was discussed in module two. If the pilot of the bird dog aircraft cannot sound a warning, he will move the aircraft wings from side to side as a warning. The procedure which ground crews follow during retardant drops is as follows. One, the straw boss will be advised by radio of the impending drop and will warn the crew to vacate the area. Two, the straw boss will tell the crew what action to take. This action most likely will be to observe the flight path of the bird dog aircraft and move at a 90 degree angle of direction away from the flight path. Three, you are to walk briskly until you are well clear of the drop area. Four, when you think you are clear of the flight path, turn and watch the aircraft and make sure you are at a safe distance. Five, stay clear until the all clear siren sounds like this. or your straw boss tells you to return to the fire. Well, that siren does help keep you awake. Let's have a quick review of this module on working safely with tools and equipment. These rules for safe working are the result of years of experience of forest fire fighting. They are not dreamed up by a committee. The simple hand tool can cause serious injury if misused. Avoid misuse of a tool by keeping tools sharp, by protecting sharp edges, by carrying tools the right way, by transporting tools secured in place, and by using the right tool for the job. We will not go through a review of these tools. Your local facilitator will work with you to help you to become familiar with these tools. It is important that you maintain firm footing, since loss of footing is the prime cause of accidents on the fire line. In general, stay at least two tree lengths away from working skidders and tractors, and do not stay downhill from a working skidder or tractor. Attract the operator's attention if you wish to approach a working tractor. If you are assigned to work with a machine operator, get a safety briefing before starting. Use brightly colored clothing and hard hat. Safety around helicopters will be reviewed in more detail by your facilitator.
Retardant drops from air tankers are dangerous events. Know how to proceed to avoid being caught in the drop path and know how to protect yourself if caught in the drop path. And as we covered in fair, at fair length this morning, you've got two minutes once you hear that warning siren to get out of the way. Okay, please, if you have any questions, do give us a call. We can't accept collect calls, but we do have a toll-free line. The number is 112-800-663-1277. And if you're within the local calling area of Greater Vancouver, 228-1411. Uh, while we're waiting for your calls, a uh, couple of questions to my colleagues here in the studio. Jeff, let me ask you this one first. I get the impression that there's a lot more to helicopter safety than we had time to cover in the tape module there. That's right, Jim. As a matter of fact, each student will be given this brochure uh, that are attending the course at the, out there at the present time. So I would suggest that each uh, student take the time to really fully read this uh, brochure after the course takes place. A student won't be expected to refuel the helicopter. A student won't be expected uh, on their first few days on the fire line to, to use cargo equipment, the hook on the bottom of the helicopter. Mm -hmm. Basically, um, we assign that to people that have been fully trained in that thing. I think the main uh, concern here is that there is a considerable amount of helicopter use, and therefore, at least the basic safety uh, rules should apply to anybody around the helicopter. Don't load, unload, or refuel them. Don't uh, you nope. get out? You get out. You get out of the way of the rotors. You don't wait for the always. To take off. Always stay within visual sight of the pilot. Never walk uphill away from the rotors because sometimes you're working on quite steep ground. Mm -hmm. And crouch down and move uh, quickly but smoothly away from the helicopter until you're beyond the radius of the rotor. Jeff, thank you. Over to Fred. Uh, uh, give us a little bit of a briefing on some of those tools we've seen. All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, in the module, we covered some of the tools, but we covered them quite quickly. I'd like to probably just review and emphasize some of the most important points on the tools. First, on sharpening. I'd like to see a glove on, on the hand of anybody who's going to sharpen a tool. Gives you. Uh, you're, you're wearing leather. Should it be leather? Yes, 100% leather gloves, the best. Uh, use a file that has a hand guard on it, like this, that will protect your hand. Now is that and standard uh, issue? Uh, the files I'm going to get out, they're going to be going to have those hand guards. Uh, many times, the file you you get will not may not have a hand guard on it, but uh, as was shown in the film, you can take a block of wood and attach that to the end of the file in place of a handle. You can take a block of wood on there, and a fairly large block of wood uh, with gloves can uh, give you adequate protection. So with this guard on it, you should take your tool, and again, it should be firmly supported by the ground or against a stump or in a vise and with a guard like this and you always push the file generally away from you and against the cutting edge of the tool. You can see this shovel has been sharpened uh, right down along the edge and it can be sharpened right back to the tail of the shovel and it can be used very effectively in cutting brush. Again, that's why a sharp tool and properly sharpened is the safest and the most effective for you on the fire line. Fair to say you should always sharpen a shovel? One, does, wasn't, one doesn't think of that doing local gardening or something? No, generally uh, when you buy a shovel from the hardware store, they're fairly sharp and uh, when they are issued by the Ministry of Forest to you on the fire line, they are sharp to begin with and they should always be maintained sharp. The old adage, a sharp tool is a safe tool, stands uh, in good stead with a shovel as well as, well as it does with an axe. One of the other points that I think was uh, covered quite quickly in the module there is how to carry a tool. I've seen too many people take a tool like this, throw it over their head and it, you can well imagine if you slip, the sharp point can come back down the back of your neck, cut your neck open. There's somebody behind you, you can swing around, hit them in the back of the head with the shovel, and that person might be me or you or your friend. Always carry the tool on your downhill side, preferably with the uh, base of the shovel down like this. If you're carrying two tools, which you may do, generally carry the sharpest tool or the most hazardous one. Here we have a Pulaski, and you can see both it has two cutting edges on it, and so you can't carry both of them down, but generally carry the most hazardous tool in your downhill hand and the less hazardous tool in the uphill hand, always with the cutting edges ahead of you and the tails behind, like that. Carrying the Pulaski, you've got the uh, one blade down and one blade up. Is that, is that the proper... With yes, you generally carry the most hazardous blade down, and here the axe, the axe blade is the most hazardous, so you carry that blade down with the Pulaski and up, like that. Mm -hmm. 
transport, again, not over the shoulder, over the top of your head like this. Again, you can bring the thing down on the back of your neck and uh, provide a very nasty cut to yourself. So always carry them uh, in the downhill side, and if you fall, the tool is going to fall away from you, and you can uh, be saved, perhaps serious injury. The second point I'd like to emphasize is don't lay a tool down on the ground. Uh, you can fall on it. I've seen guys sit down next to their tools and stick their hand on it. Instead, lay it up against a stump, a log, or a tree. You don't get them lost. You're not apt to uh, cut yourself on them. They're not going to be a hazard for somebody to trip over. One point that was in the shown in the film there, which may be acceptable in some cases, is to bury <coughs> the cutting tool in a stump like that. I prefer to see them stood up. If you may bury this in a stump, you still have an, an exposed cutting edge, which you can cut your hand on. Is that uh, shovel the only size uh, suitable? Now there are, are two types of shovels. We have here the standard uh, shovel you buy in a hardware store. You see the head is much bigger than the standard firefighting shovel here, and, uh, and the handle is much longer. These shovels uh, can be used for fighting fire and uh, probably used by the local gardener in his gardening. This is the standard firefighting shovel. It is a shorter handle and a smaller head, which is much more effective in uh, throwing dirt, uh, less tiring on the firefighter, and certainly much easier to transport with the shorter handle. Okay, if get you to uh, stay there in case we get any more questions. We have a couple of people on the telephone now with calls. Uh, hello, Nanaimo. Hello. Hi, I've got a question? Yeah, okay. I wear glasses, and I can't see 50 feet without them. Will it affect my work very much? Okay, we're a little off the topic of tools, but let's cover that one anyway, Jeff. Certainly. Um, no, glasses are acceptable, uh, and certainly we have lots of people in our ministry that, that have to wear glasses as well. I think the main thing that you should have with the, with the uh, glasses, of course, is an elastic band uh, that goes from the behind your ears, from, from the back of the, of the, behind your ears, across the back of your head, so that when you... Uh, get involved in physical activity that is more than you'd ordinarily expect at home or and so on as the athletes do and then you'll be just fine got another call from the island uh, hello Port Alberni yeah I was wondering what a average firefighter might make as a wage yeah. the bottom uh, line salary for uh, firefighters uh, is six dollars and eighty cents an hour and that's only when you get called up eh? that's right yeah Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Are we missing anything here, Fred, before we uh, carry on to the next module? Have we covered tools? I think we've covered them pretty adequately, Jim. Uh, at least the important points, again, are transporting the, pool, uh, the tool to and from the fire line, keeping it shut. I, 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 as a firefighter, am responsible to carry my own tools. Yes. Uh, you and should always take uh, the tool assigned to you by your straw boss. He will select the best complement, best mixture of tools among the crew and he'll expect you to maintain that tool and return it at the end of the day. How many tools? A Pulaski and a shovel do the job? A Pulaski, shovel, a Maddox, a fire rake, fire broom, uh, a Sandvik, brush hook, chainsaw. These are some of the do types of common tools. I carry all this myself? You don't have to carry them all yourself, Jim, but again, your straw boss, he will be responsible for uh, deciding the mix of tools that you should have in your crew and which one you will be assigned to. Yeah, you get them assigned, you get to carry them. Right. Okay. Do, uh, do firefighters often get separated from tools? Does that happen? Do you Very find seldom. yourselves a, a few a, short? A good firefighter will never be separated from a shovel or his axe or whatever is given to him. The 10-foot rule, is that because it, uh, those shovels require a 10-foot swing to chop down small brush and so on? No, they don't require a 10-foot uh, swing, but uh, it's, too e it's very easy for men to get bunched up on a fire line. People like people. They tend to, uh, to work too close together. And so it's a good idea to stay at least 10 feet apart, and then you've got a little room for maneuvering within that uh, distance. Okay, enough of tools. Let's get on to uh, Module 4. Now, this one deals with uh, fire behavior, how fires work. You are watching Module 4, Fire Behavior. What you're about to see is a film which, which was prepared a few years ago by the Forest Service of the United States Department of Agriculture. The use of this film in this program is just one example of the cooperation which exists between the USA and Canada in forest protection. Although this film is a few years old, the basics of fire behavior do not change. 
5,000 acres are burning in this forest fire. It has consumed several million board feet of timber, burned out a half mile of power line, nine miles of telephone line, two bridges, a store and a service station. It has destroyed part of an important watershed, burned up the habitat where fish and game, up to now, have been able to thrive. unleashed this destructive force? Well, it began simply enough. Perhaps a carelessly thrown match. Then, before long, a raging inferno. Yet every fire that starts like this doesn't become a big fire, because men, like you, intervene and stop it. Men who know how fire behaves. In order to control fire, you must learn all you can about it and the factors that influence its spread. For the more you know about fire, the more likely you are to make the decisions and perform the acts that will either prevent fires or keep them small. Fire begins with ignition. The match is the most common ignition material. Friction creates sufficient heat to ignite the phosphorus. Combustion occurs. The match flames. The three most important ingredients necessary for combustion are heat, oxygen, and fuel. Heat Oxygen and fuel create fire. If any of these ingredients are missing, there can be no fire. Here in this demonstration, we have all the ingredients necessary for combustion. Heat from the match. Fuel in the candle. And oxygen from the air. But remove one of the ingredients in this case the oxygen, and the fire goes out. The same principle is used in fighting forest fires. We stop such fires by removing heat, by removing oxygen, by removing fuel. In forest fires, heat sufficient to cause combustion is transferred to new sources of fuel in three different ways. By conduction, by convection, and by radiation. Conduction is transfer of heat within the material itself. Most metals are good heat conductors. But wood, on the other hand, is a poor conductor and transmits heat slowly. Hence, conduction is not an important factor in the spread of forest fires. Convection is transfer of heat by flow of liquids or gases. In the case of forest fires, convection is well illustrated by the air and burn gases which rise above the fire. If the heated mixture is confined to a column, the convection current is strong, perhaps strong enough to reach 15,000 feet or more into the air. Convection may cause dry snags to burn rapidly. Another method of transferring heat is by radiation. The Earth, for instance, is heated from the sun by radiation through space.
In forest fires, the fuel ahead may be dried by radiation and sometimes ignited. How fire behaves when only one piece of fuel is involved is simple in comparison with the complex nature of a forest fire when a variety of fuels are combined with a lot of other influences. The principal influences acting on fire behavior are fuel, weather, and topography, or lay of the land. The first of the big three is fuel. Fire behavior is affected by the amount of moisture in the fuel. Dry fuel burns faster than wet fuel. Size and character of fuel is a factor. Fine fuels burn faster than coarse fuels. Fine fuels are more quickly heated and ignited as they are surrounded by plenty of oxygen. Fires in fine fuels spread rapidly but burn out quickly. Heavy fuels warm more slowly and interiors are exposed to oxygen only after the outside is burned off. Volume or quantity of fuel on an area is a rather obvious factor. The more fuel, the more total heat output. Ordinarily, the greater the volume of fuel readily available for burning, the more intense will be the fire. There's low volume here. And high volume here. But a certain volume of fuel may be arranged in different ways. Thus, continuity and arrangement may be more important factors than the volume itself. The fuels may be spread evenly over the ground. Or they may be patchy and broken up. There may be little of the fuel standing in the air as snags. Or there may be a lot of snags. All these will affect the behavior of a fire. Along with fuel, another important influence on fire behavior is the second big three, weather. Temperature of the air influences fire most indirectly. There may be 50 degrees difference between fuel temperatures in the sun and in the shade. Temperature of the fuel determines how fast it will ignite and burn. Certainly one of the most important, least understood, and least predictable influences affecting fire behavior is wind. Wind makes fire burn faster by increasing the supply of oxygen and by driving convection heat into new fuel. Wind encourages combustion and spread of the fire in one direction or it can cause it to spread erratically. Wind carries sparks and firebrands ahead of the main fire, starting spot fires. Wind increases evaporation from damp surfaces by carrying away moist air and bringing in drier air. These processes are exaggerated here. 
this evaporative effect ties in with another. The effect of fuel moisture on rate of combustion is what determines its influence on fire behavior. When fuel is moist, combustion is slow because part of the heat required for ignition is used to evaporate the moisture. As fuels become drier, more heat is available to heat the fuel itself. Relative humidity is an important factor affecting fire behavior. It does this indirectly. Dead forest fuels and the air are always exchanging moisture. Dry air, air with low humidity, absorbs moisture from the fuels. Fuels, in turn, absorb moisture from the air when the humidity is high. Fuel moisture always tends to go up or down whenever the humidity changes. Light flashy fuels gain or lose moisture quickly with changes in relative humidity. Fine dead grass, for example, readily shows the difference due to humidity. Heavier fuels, on the other hand, respond to humidity changes much more slowly. All these factors of weather, then, will affect the behavior of a fire. Along with fuel and weather, topography completes the big three influences on fire behavior. Aspect or direction in which a slope faces determines how much heating it gets from the sun. And, of course, heated fuels ignite and burn more rapidly. Slope is another factor of topography. The steeper the slope, the faster the fire burns. On a slope, the unignited fuels above the fire are closer to the flame and catch fire more quickly. One reason why fires usually burn uphill. The position of the fire, whether near the bottom or the top of a ridge, is a topographic factor. The shape of the country is an important factor when fire is burning in rugged topography. For example, when the canyon is narrow, fire will easily cross. Heat transfer by adjacent radiation dries out the unburned slope. Steep V canyons also frequently have the same effect on fire as the chimney on your stove. They create a forced draft. Another effect of topography is shown in the influence of elevation. This is shown by the earlier drying out of the low country in early spring and in other ways. So these are all special ways in which the influence of topography on fire behavior makes itself felt. Looking back, we have seen that the fire triangle is necessary for combustion to occur. Heat, fuel, oxygen. Once a fire starts, it spreads by transferring heat energy, by conduction, by convection, and by radiation. The behavior of the fire after it becomes established is governed by the big three, fuel, weather, and topography, all acting together.
When all three are favorable for the spread of the fire, anything can happen. That is, anything can happen unless you, as a firefighter, intervene. One way to keep destructive fires from developing is for you to decide firefighting strategy from knowledge of how a fire will behave in its changing environment, rather than to shape strategy to fit what the fire has already done. Is this just a log or is it fuel to sustain a fire? Is this slope merely a hard climb or is it a made to order ladder for fire? And what about this? Just a breathtaking view? Or is it a stoked and ready furnace, needing only a light? Think in terms of fire wherever you are, or whatever you're doing. Remember, it is the sum of many factors that make a fire burn the way it does. By way of a review of the film, we will now emphasize some points about fire and fire behavior. As discussed in Module 1, there is an average of 2,500 wildfires in British Columbia each year. Lightning causes 37% of these fires. Industrial activity causes 25% of these, and the public causes 38%. There are three kinds of wildfires, ground fires, surface fires, and crown fires. A ground fire is on or beneath the forest floor. When it is beneath the forest floor, it is in the roots and duff. Duff is the accumulation of needles and other residue from the vegetation which lies on the floor of the forest. Ground fires are particularly dangerous since they can smolder for days or weeks and then ignite. A surface fire is on and above the forest floor but has not reached the upper foliage or crowns. A crown fire is in the upper foliage and crowns of standing timber. It is important for you to know why a fire spreads, since your safety can depend on how well and how quickly you can recognize a potentially dangerous situation. Three factors influence the spread of fire. These are fuel, weather, and the lay of the land. Within these three factors, there are many variables. One of the variables which must be stressed is wind. Wind feeds the oxygen side of the fire triangle. The stronger the wind, the faster the fire will spread. Wind flattens the flame, which then preheats the fuel ahead. Wind causes spot fires ahead of the main fire by blowing sparks across the fire line. Wind blows uphill at 5 to 10 miles per hour during the day. Sun-warmed air rises to produce an air current. This air current will reverse direction at night. Prevailing winds must be considered in the fire attack plan. Prevailing winds are the normal winds of the region and are determined by the land mass, the lay of the land, the season, and the time of day. Thunderstorm winds may reach 70 miles per hour. This can result in very quick spread of fire. If the increase in wind strength is accompanied by a change in wind direction, a dangerous situation may result. A typical windswept fire may travel at 20 miles per hour. Since air is usually more moist during the night than during the day, fires burn more slowly at night. This means that there is an advantage in attempting to suppress a forest fire before the air warms up in the morning. For this reason, British Columbia firefighters follow a rule of making every effort to suppress a fire by 10 a.m. of the following morning. This calls for a control action on the fire line to begin at first light. In order to do this, breakfast and travel must be completed before first light. If there is one thing to remember about fire behavior, it is that there are many variables to contend with. Another variable is the human element. The human element enters the scene when a fire starts. The first action at the fire site is to size up the situation. Accurate size up is vital to early suppression, and this accuracy requires a clear understanding of fire behavior. Your worth as a firefighter depends on how clearly you understand forest fire behavior. 
get to size up in a minute. The numbers to call again in Greater Vancouver, 228-1411, and the toll-free number for a long-distance call, 112-800-663-1277. call from Port Alberni. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, uh, there's two questions I've got to ask uh, one of them. Is uh, like the initial uh, initial attack crew, uh, they they don't have whistles like for an emergency if something happens. I noticed I fought fires out here on one of the canal fires, and uh, none of them have whistles for emergency. What do they can they do about that? Can you, do they issue that out, or you have to buy your own? No, certainly no one would have to buy their own whistle. Um, we don't uh, under usual circumstances. Uh, provide whistles in any case. We normally expect the uh, foreman or the straw boss to give uh, oral commands or to shout to the crew in emergency situations and so on. However, I would be certainly, I uh, wouldn't be opposed to the use of, of uh, signals. Normally the people aren't that far away that we make sure that they're always within at least visual dis distance of each other. Did, Did you say you had a second question? Yeah, uh, when, well I took the like, uh, I didn't make the course last year, I just made one session, but the, this year they said you need that, what, that paper or some kind of ticket uh, you need to, to certify that you're taking the course. And I had two years experience in the firefighting, and I also was a straw bus on this fire, so uh, uh, how do I approach them about that? Okay, go to your, uh, the local district office there in Port Alberni and discuss it with the protection officer. I guess I should stress at this point is that we will have be giving preference to those people who are and will be certified after this course is completed, but we are still going to take uh, experienced people on fires. If, you don't, if you're not certified, that doesn't mean that you won't be available for firefighting duty. Well, they told me that uh, I needed a ticket or to uh, go fight fires, even though I had two, or two years' experience at uh, fires before. Yes, that, that is unfortunate, and I would suggest that you make every effort to get yourself certified. We will give preference to those that are certified. Okay? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, sir. One more quick call before we get to a couple of other matters uh, from Port Alberni. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Yes. Uh, I was wondering, like, uh, the environment itself and uh, animals that are caught in the fire, is there uh, danger to the people working on the fire line from animals? Um, the only, uh, not in terms of a stampede of, of, of animals off of a fire that, uh, off of an area that's burning, there, in my experience, there's only been a few instances where uh, animals were involved in a fire. Uh, it's, I really can't explain it, but it seems to me that the ungulates, the deer, the, and so on, um, uh, seem to just leave an area where it's obvious that there's going to be fire. I wish I had the knowledge that they have in fire behavior. I think the one of the real problems, though, that we do have in certain areas, and you'll have to watch out for, uh, and that deals with bears that are coming into fire camps. We really have to make sure that our garbage is well looked after so that bears don't become a problem. Gee, that's interesting. Just uh, a way out there, 100 miles from nowhere, you've still got the same problems we have in uh, <laughs> urban. Just as many. Yeah. Let me get to this question of size up. We just mentioned at the end of the tape there. What is size up? Who does it? And who should know about it? Well, we, we would hope that everybody has a knowledge of <coughs> fire behavior, uh, Jim. But basically, it is the responsibility of the fire boss to, when he gets to the fire, to stand back, uh, take an entire perspective on the fire, the surrounding area, and then make a determination as to what that fire will do, especially during the heat of the day that's coming up. He is the one that sizes it up. Can, I, can that be done with uh, some degree of accuracy? Oh, yes, indeed. I think the main thing, of course, is the knowledge of weather, a knowledge of uh, the weather forecasting system, what fire danger classes that were that is going on, what the forecast for, for that day will be, and then a good knowledge, of course, of uh, all the various types of forest fuels. As uh, I said before, if it's lodgepole pine, very thick, you can expect some really serious problems that afternoon. Uh, average fire line worker, Fred, does he need to know that much? Isn't the boss doing the sizing up? Uh, certainly, Jim. The fire boss or the straw boss will be doing 
the overall sizing up and be, and be taking responsibility for the whole fire. But each individual firefighter should be very aware of what's happening around him. He should be able to at least predict what's going to happen in his section of fire by reading weather, paying attention to which direction the wind is, uh, which direction the fire is moving. And by being aware of this and kind of predicting what's going to happen to the fire, he can do two main things right off I can think of. One is he can make his work much more effective. He can uh, widen the fire guard, he can knock down a hot spot because he can kind of tell what's going to happen. And uh. the second thing is he can uh, be aware of danger. A, uh, a flare safety, up, if nothing else. A, uh, yeah. a, a, uh, a snag, uh, fire moving in a direction it wasn't uh, expected to move uh, to begin with, and he can uh, move himself uh, to defend himself against this particular, uh, you know, un unpredictable behavior. And secondly, he can pass it on to a straw boss who may take other and more remedial action on it. Thanks, Fred. Quick call from Kamloops. Go ahead, please. Yes, could you uh, discuss for us briefly the use and misuse of the hand tank pump? Uh, Me? Sure. <laughs> sure, Jeff. <laughs> yes, um, I think probably the uh, when you're using hand, hand tank bumps on a fire, uh, you're working with very little water, and of course canvas is a classic example of that. You're lucky to have a uh, canvas bag of water for drinking and a hand tank pump in many areas. One of the uh, uh, things that you should do is consider the use of water with a hand tank pump just to cool down those hot spots, to um, assist with dirt in containing the fire, because after all, we're really trying to remove the fuel at this point, and really conserve your water for those actions. Don't try to extinguish the fire with water. It's impossible, and probably will just prolong the agony. Okay, we've been uh, uh, mentioned in the, in the tape there the, the, the question of aspect. Uh, slope has a number of meanings. Aspect takes one meaning of slope. And uh, it's over to Fred to give us some further explanation on that. Yes, thank you, Jim. Aspect and slope uh, are confusing terms, and many times people use these uh, terms interchangeably. For the true meaning, slope generally refers to the steepness of an incline or the steepness of a hill. This is a steep slope or a steep hill. And slope is generally expressed in uh, percent or perhaps degrees. That's how See it on the it highway is. sign, nine degree slope, seven degree slope. Right. So here we have a steep slope, and here maybe we have a shallow slope or a more gentle slope on this side. And uh, some people will refer to this also as a, either a north slope or a south slope. And this is where you get the uh, mix up with aspect. The direction a slope faces generally uh, is, what, is what is known as aspect. If you have the sun over here, and it's uh, 12 noon. At noon, the sun is directly due south and hits this slope. This, so, this slope here, then, is actually an aspect or a south aspect. On the other side of the hill here, this, this uh, side of the hill faces the opposite direction or north. It's a north aspect, also referred to as a north slope. But the true terminology aspect is generally the direction that slope faces. Slope is the steepness of the gradient. So it's, it could be a 10 degree slope, but it's a north or south aspect. Right. We have a 10 degree, or it could even be 10 percent slope here on a north aspect. And uh, for anybody having trouble, please ask your facilitator, and I'm sure uh, he or she'll help you out as we go along. Um, let me get you to, Jeff, get you to elaborate on underground fires. We saw a little bit of gain in the module. How do they work? Well, <clears throat> first of all, Jim, we have to recognize that fire is a it burns all fuels, and there are a great amount of fuel underground, organic material. Actually, the humus in your garden will burn if it's hot enough and dry enough. I thought there would be that much oxygen there. Well, you don't really require all that much oxygen. And that what we are concerned about, of course, is making sure that the fire is not going to spread from that particular area. So it's imperative that the firefighters get down with their trenches and their digging tools right down to mineral soil, because mineral soil will not burn. And all that in, uh, organic material that is underground will burn once it dries out in sufficiently, and therefore you have to get your mineral soil guard deep enough to cut that off. C can you compare uh, the danger of this to, say, the danger of a, uh, a surface or crown fire? No. Uh, the only <coughs> serious danger that you can get involved in with uh, subsurface fires 
is after the fire has been burning down there for uh, hours or days, and then you will get hot spots that are domed and hollow inside. And if you were to accidentally step into an area where it's partly burned away, then you could get burned or, or perhaps an ankle twisted or something along those lines. These go on for months and months and miles and miles, or? It, they quite. have, they have, yes. We have had mop-ups even as uh, early as last year that went on for six weeks after the fire was contained. All right. Quick call from Campbell River. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I was wondering uh, what he was just saying about uh, fires burning underground. Is that the same as a, an open grass fire And uh, in the interior of BC? Uh, I worked on one outside of Ashcroft there. And it would, uh, the wind just blew it and spread it across like two or three acres. And we had to get out of the way. It was just, the wind came up and blew it across the top of the grass. Um, after we could uh, make a fire break or something like that, it burnt underground and came back underneath us and came up behind us. Yes, it does, it does happen quite often. Um, the, the, uh, the, where the fire is burning underground, of course, it's followed probably in the Ashcroft area, a yellow pine root or a Douglas fir root that was uh, perhaps in most cases a, uh, a tree that had already died. But uh, if you're go going back to your first uh, question there, that is a surface fire or a ground fire that occurred in the grass uh, from a technical point of view. And those are the fires, of course, that uh, uh, concern us the most when we take initial attack on them. The subsurface fire are those that, that uh, are much more difficult to, to extinguish, but usually do not give us the problems as far as control is concerned. Uh, another telephone call, this time from Comox. Go ahead, please. Um, hi there. We had, uh, for Module 1 and 2, we missed, and Oops. near the end of Module 2, you had a bunch of terms relating to uh, chimney, blow-up, and bunch of other terms, and we just wondered if you could go over them quickly so we could write them down. Well, we want us to do a little test, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Guys. I will try. I don't know. promise to catch them all, but... Uh, Chimney, of course, as I said before, was uh, an area that uh, geographically uh, it occurs <clears throat> where you, the geology of the country makes a, a vent or a, an area similar to your fireplace at home where the uh, fire in that area will really be serious because of the uh, funneling of oxygen into the inflammable material. Uh, did you have another... Um, terminology that you're not familiar with? Um, well, we sort of missed them all. Like, there's a, there's a list of about eight or nine of <laughs> them. Um, I wonder if the advanced facilitator could help them out. Yes. You, do you have a facilitator there? Um, no, no. We're just in, uh, sitting around. <laughs> oh, I see. Gee. Okay, contact your... Uh, where are you calling from again? Comox. Comox. Uh, get a hold of the uh, uh, Camel River District Office there, and they'll give you the information that you missed. At Campbell River. And uh, we're going to have to leave it at that because we got to go. We'll be back in an hour from now at about 3 o'clock and finish up with modules number 5 and 6. We still need to hear from facilitators we haven't heard from. And if you have any more questions, please bring them up starting an hour from now. We'll see you then. You have been watching the program Basic Fire Behavior and Suppression. The program was designed by the Forest Service Training School and is sponsored by the Protection Branch of the Ministry of Forests. The Protection Branch is responsible for fire management and pest and disease control in our forests. Technical assistance was provided by the audiovisual section of the Information Services Branch of the Ministry of Forests.